you can build a beautiful home, but if you don't light it in the right, right way, if you have the wrong color lighting, you know, if, if you're running a 4,000 or 5,000 Kelvin instead of a 2,700, it, it gives a, you know, it's that sterile white light versus, you know, something nice and warm it has a very different dif- uh, impact. And we're live. Welcome to 3D Media Life Podcast. I'm your host, Dimitri, and we're here at beautiful 1200 Bel Air. This is not your usual setting that you're used to seeing in our studio. Today, we decided to do something different and uh, have an amazing guest today, highly anticipated. I wanted to have a podcast with him for a while, finally got the chance to do so. I have Raj with me. That's uh, kind of the brain behind the brain and the hands behind building this beautiful <laughs> mansion. One of the probably most amazing spec homes in uh, all of California, maybe in the world. It's $139 million. I'm sure you've heard about it before. We shot a video about it, went viral. Mr. Beast had a video about it, went viral. In fact, um, it's probably, if I had to guess, the most viewed home on the internet today. By far. Um, that's, I think, a reasonable statement to make. And it's there's a reason for that, because it, it is so unique. It is absolutely amazing, one-of-a-kind piece of art, and I have the guy that was responsible for making it happen. <laughs> uh, welcome, Raj, to the show. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Um, and I, you know, I, I played a part in it. I'll, I'll say there were there were many, many hands that that went into it. Um, it was an absolute privilege and, and pleasure to be part of this uh, pl- part of this project. Um, it was almost five, six years, um, literally blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, but it was it was an absolute pleasure. And uh, and thank you so much for all the the complimentary things you you said about the home. Uh, it it truly is a, a one in a million or or you know or one in the world, <laughs> one in the world. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and everything you know throughout this home was was truly custom. So it it took a lot of uh, a special effort, um, especially during COVID, to make it happen. So so thank you so much uh, for coming out, uh, coming out, My and our beautiful view and. Yeah, we start off with uh, we we just we were kind of thinking what what is the best spot to film, and nothing beats <laughs> just being outside in complete privacy with the uh, 180 degree views of LA, and it's just gorgeous weather today. Very yeah. fun to be outside, and I can only imagine what the owner is going to feel when he buys this property and just chilling here. And it's just the privacy, the sereneness of this atmosphere, and the views are unbelievable. And I mean, like every square inch you walk through the place. Every part is unbelievable. It's kind of hard to choose where where you want to land. We, uh, I mean, I'll say you know I know we were looking at, at multiple different rooms and and what what's going to be the best shot. Um, I mean, this view is is spectacular, and like you said, that the privacy you get up here uh, is just amazing. I mean, we're we're relatively close to to Bel Air Road here, but you you don't hear anything. Um, you don't have neighbors. You don't have anyone peering over you. You, you you're right at the top of really the crest of uh, Bel Air Road. So, you know, this is truly Billionaire's Row, uh, some amazing houses on the street. I'm, I'm partial. I think this is the most amazing one, but um, you're, you're really at the crest. So you don't have anyone above you looking down on you. You're looking down on top of, you know, you're looking down on the rest of, uh, of L.A. And, and as you can see, uh, it's, it's an absolutely beautiful view from, from the roof deck. You can see all the way out to the ocean in Catalina. You can see downtown. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, once in a lifetime view. And then infinity, infinity pool just makes it so much better. It does. It does. I, I would say this, I would probably never dare to do a podcast outside anywhere else <laughs> because there's always noises and everything right. going on, but here it's just so serene. It's perfect. Like you can't find a better spot. Can't beat mother nature with some, uh, architecture behind yourself. Right. Yeah. On this side, you have the beautiful home and we'll put some uh, more videos of that for people that have, haven't seen it. Please look at the link below where you can check out the house in more detail. Okay. But uh, tell me, first of all, how did you get into building some of the best homes or most expensive homes and both in, in the world? How, like, how does a person get such a job? You know, I, um, I, I was in tech for about 15 years and uh, that, that was my background. I had a couple of different startups. I, I was consulting for the better part of seven or eight years and spent half the year on, on the road. And my last tech company, uh, Dealer Pinch, um, we ended up by, you know, winning South by Southwest and, and uh, building it up, ended up selling it off. And at that point, I, I received a job offer in, uh, in Germany. And I had a newborn. I, I had a wife. And uh, at the time, she was like, listen, I, I don't want you spending two weeks out of the year. Or sorry, two weeks out of every month in, in Germany 
and said, listen, why don't you look into uh, into development? And she said she had lots of friends who, who do it, and it seems like a an easy uh, <laughs> an easy job. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I worked with one of my friends for five or six months, and uh, at, at the time, I didn't think it was it was the right fit, but I, I enjoyed the space. And then I ended up meeting my my mentor, uh, Joe Inglinoff, and he uh, he took a chance on me and said, "Hey, listen, you know this is what we're working on. I'm not entirely sure how how you'll you'll fit in initially." And uh, and the rest is history. It's been it's been seven years now. Wow! And just a, a, a truly amazing uh, mentor. Amazing. He's like a big brother. Uh, really took me under his wing. Uh, has taught me just an immeasurable amount. And uh, and especially on on this project, we have another another home at uh, ninety three thirty Flicker Way. Um, we did a, a house in uh, in Malibu, right on on Carbon Beach. But but throughout, uh, you know, there there was a lot of opportunity to create some really unique elements and uh, and really draw on a lot of my tech uh, background to uh, to spice things up. So how does one get into it? Honestly, just happenstance. You you, you end up meeting the right person at the right time. You, you have a life shift and you say, hey, I, I want to try something different. For, for me, it wasn't uh, even necessarily a, a long-term goal. It wasn't something I, I really truly planned on. It, uh, it just kind of happened. And, and I've loved every minute of it. Uh, it's, it's long days. It's uh, long nights. It, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience, wonderful ride. And I've been absolutely blessed and privileged to, to work on so many amazing, amazing projects. So this was definitely not your first project working with Joe, right? And building it. No. Home. So I I, uh, I I worked with him uh, for about six eight months. We we finished off one in in Malibu. That's the one you yep. mentioned earlier, right on on PCH. It was stunning. I was. How I was, big was that project? It was a fifty five hundred square foot home uh, on Billionaires Row on Carbon Beach. Every square inch was impeccable. And one thing that you know Joe's taught me: if you're going to do something, do it right. Um, every you know, if it's a five thousand square foot home or or a 36,000 square foot home like this every every corner every inch every stitch has to be perfect right you you're looking for a discerning buyer and they're going to notice those those details and and so that attention to detail is truly what separates the uh you know the wannabes oh, from right. from the doing and and the you know the guys truly uh producing amazing product out there so uh yeah I mean, I, I can't even imagine how much exponentially more challenging it is to go from 5,500 square feet, 36,000 square feet, and still keep the same attention to detail. That's quite incredible. It's, um, I mean, it's it's literally as as you would expect. Okay, seven seven x the the square footage, so it's seven x the the effort. It's the same amount of of uh, effort per square foot that, that you're really making sure every detail is perfect. And that's uh, that's what really stands out is is making sure yeah every, every square inch. I mean I've I've gone through this place multiple times on literally my hands and knees. Wow, and scrubbing out corners or or you know uh, doing doing touch up details, and uh, and that's that's the difference that you'll see between this and and a lot of the kind of spec homes out there. Yeah, I mean I've seen many incredibly luxurious homes, but when you do scale it up, it that's where problems start. People just cannot keep track of everything it probably took incredible amount of dedication and you you mentioned you 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 were going through covid as well when did you start what year did you start working on this house so uh wow this house started in i want to say 20 2024 2017 and so the the foundation was a year and a half almost two uh we're sitting on on almost three acres and it's it's uh, just a straight shot down. Yeah, we'll show some drone so, footage over there. <laughs> so the uh, the foundation work on it was was just absolutely brutal. Um, the the number of caissons uh, was just immense, and so getting to a flat buildable surface start to be able to work took probably a year and a half, almost two. Um, it's it's something that uh, if someone said, "Hey, Raj, do this again today," I, I I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would recommend it to someone. Just, just based off the amount of labor and, uh, and then yeah, COVID hit. And so a majority of the materials in this home are coming from either Italy or Spain or Portugal. We had uh, craftsmen coming in from Italy that would stay here for months on end. We had, uh, uh, we have between four and a half, five million dollars worth of chandeliers here from the Czech Republic. 
They were sending over, they were supposed to send over a crew to do all the install. And so trying to find materials in the middle of COVID, dealing with shipping issues, dealing with manpower issues, dealing with uh, the, the city and the state shutting down and opening and shutting down and I, opening. I cannot even imagine. It, it was... Uh, it was it was a little difficult. Did you ever stop at any point, or just the work continued? We we had a couple of weeks. So right at That's the it. onset, wow. um, yeah, right right at the onset of of COVID, so kind of March, we uh, we essentially shut down. We we didn't know where the state was going. Everything kind of locked down. At that point, we put a lot of protocols into place. Um, you know, everyone was wearing masks on site. Everyone had gloves. Everyone was keeping their distance. It it became a logistic nightmare. I'm saying, okay, I can have one person working over here, one person working over here, keep 10 feet distance. And and so it it <laughs> added additional layers of uh, complexity wow. onto an already complex job. Well, thankfully, the place is big enough where you can actually space out like 200 workers for 10 feet away from each other. <laughs> it helps. I'll, I'll say this is one of the times where, where the magnitude of, of the home definitely uh, helps, uh, you know, keep in compliance. I mean, you got to give credit also to the the skilled laborers that were putting their hours into this uh, house. They they weren't afraid to work during COVID and stuff. That's pretty impressive. And uh, we we had a few who who dropped out and and used naturally uh, COVID as as an excuse or you know justifiable reason. Uh, but but a lot of the guys, uh, you know, were really dedicated to the project. We're we're here going going through and and in the trenches in an uncertain time. And really wanted to see this uh, see this completed, and and it's a testament to them. Uh, I obviously didn't didn't build this self uh, <laughs> build this by myself, and I would be on site every day at six thirty with with the crews. I was usually the first guy here and the last guy to leave, but uh, the, I mean it was just amazing. The the guys on site, um, I, I have to give them credit. They they really yeah worked through through a daunting time. There were lots of late nights. There were lots of early mornings. And uh, and just to come out the other side was was just truly amazing. When did you guys finish? When the um, about a year and a half ago. Wow! So the uh, long journey from 2017, it, you said. Correct. Yeah, the so, overall build took almost six years. Wow. Yeah, a little over six years. What took the longest out of the entire process? Uh I mean there there were several tedious elements. I, I don't know if I could put my finger on something and say that took the longest. Um, well, let, let's actually go over some of the details okay. <laughs> that quite shocked me walking through yeah. the house. First of all, we have this beautiful mantle again. We'll try to put this on the screen to show some of the details. But um, from what I understand, you said it was nine months. How many people? We, we had three uh, stonemason here on site wow. for over nine months. And it uh, started off as, as let's say, 84 slabs, Negro Martina, uh, stones from Italy. So four foot by eight foot slabs. And they would cut them into six inch by eight inch strips and uh, little squares, basically, and hand polish each corner. And so it, it created this basket weave. And, uh, you know, hopefully you can, you can splice it a picture here. For sure. Uh, it was it was amazing. I mean, these guys were here day in, day out. They're, they're sitting here hand grinding, polishing, and they get five or six pieces done a day. And uh, and little by little, it, it came to be a, you know, 24 foot tall, uh, amazing art. I mean, I, I can say art is an art. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, one of a kind that's for sure. And it's huge. It's like not something you you just work on a tiny piece. This is goes how many feet up? Uh, 24. By how many feet wide? Oh gosh, probably 20. <laughs> well, and it goes all the way <laughs> and it around. it goes all the way around. So it, wow. it goes from the great that's room cool. and it wraps around into, uh, into the family room. And, and one thing that's really amazing. So uh, we have an a, a HVAC return, and so we finished this beautiful stone, amazing masterpiece, and then they slapped on this metal, you know, traditional HVAC return. And uh, and of course, Joe came in and was like, "No, guys, just you know, you, you have this beautiful piece of art. Why why are you gonna finish it off like this? It's an eyesore." So uh, Joe worked with them and figured out how to laser cut and figure out the exact amount of airflow we needed, and uh, and out of the same material, the same. Uh, bricks basically um, created uh, a register, wow. so it it blends in seamlessly, and, and that's what I'm talking about in terms of attention to detail. Uh, it's it's something that you know another developer may have gone. Eh, we're close enough. It's been nine right. months. I don't want to spend another week and a half doing this one element, 
and uh, and it's those details that that truly differentiate and, and separate you. Were there any um, hiccups doing something like this, for example, breaking tiles or breaking the stone along the way? Um, I mean, sure. How, how stressful <laughs> is that when you're working nonstop? And the material is not limitless, right? Uh, no, no, and especially during COVID, right? On 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 the fireplace in particular, there weren't any major hiccups. You know, sometimes you'd be polishing and and you know, a corner would crack. You'd be like, damn it, and that that would be a few hours, and and you start on another piece. And, and luckily, you know, you always buy uh, enough extra where where if that occurs, you can you can replicate or fix. But uh, there are definitely some some elements of the house where things were were irreplaceable or very difficult to replace and uh, and became a little bit uh trying <laughs> so uh, how much did that cost labor wise material well, ballpark i know it's hard to um, estimate. you know I, I i i would have to go back and and look at the records but probably close to like 700 grand at least maybe even wow. more um, I'm not entirely sure. No, it's unbelievable. No, no, I'm thinking about it with the hours and and everything. I mean, maybe close to a million. I, I, yeah. And besides the mantle, yeah, which is ridiculously <laughs> difficult to work on and expensive. What are some other parts of the home that, um, let's just say, drove you nuts a little bit? Oh wow! Uh, I think you told me something about the light downstairs in the disco room what is it called the oh space? we we have a six thousand square foot nightclub nightclub in in the basement so we we have almost five million dollars worth of chandeliers that we we bought from a company in the czech republic uh sansuchi and and just amazing beautiful chandeliers throughout the home they're very regal but they they come as individual crystal <laughs> and so we have a 44 foot 55 thousand individual crystal chandelier that goes from the from the upper floor all the way down into uh into the basement and into the nightclub and uh multiple multiple other chandeliers throughout the home in in the uh in the basement in the nightclub and this would be a great time to, to show the picture but we we have gosh it's probably 40 feet by 120 feet um a chandelier all across the ceiling we have um you know chandeliers in the wine room chandeliers in the dining room and we were supposed to have a whole crew of, of people coming from the Czech Republic to to install. So we received 190 crates worth of crystal chandeliers, uh, parts from the Czech Republic. And uh, that was in February of, of 2020. And then in March, we received an email, is COVID, we know coming. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, we're, we're, we're left with uh, crates and crates and crates. Of a beautiful, amazing crystal that we have no idea what goes with what, what parts we're missing, uh, h- how to assemble these things, and we were told, "Hey, they're not coming." It was part of their contract; they're supposed to come and install, and now it's on us to figure out. And in in particular, the the forty four foot uh, chandelier going down the stairs, they they sent us a one page uh, manual in check, and it was like, <laughs> "Okay, good luck." So, how did you figure that out? Uh, Google Translate. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but um, no, we, we ended up, that's a, a great example. We ended up shutting down the site uh, entirely. I, I had no other people working here for eight, almost nine days. We had a crew of seven, eight guys here from 6 a.m. till midnight because every day was costing us. And we were pulling out each strand uh, individually and, and crimping and, and prepping all along the uh, the great room. And and then, you know, climbing up on scaffold up to the top of the ceiling and uh, and, and connecting them all individually. So that was that was quite arduous. Uh, we, we started installing it and we realized, OK, there's quite a significant difference between kilograms and pounds. And so <laughs> this thing is exceptionally heavy and we get about half of it installed and we notice the ceiling starts drooping and we're like, ah, that's not good. We yeah, we're on fast ways, to... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, unfortunately, when when we were doing the original framing, the, the framers didn't know the difference and did it based off of pounds instead of kilograms, and so we had to take the whole thing down again. Wow. Uh, you know, cut open the ceiling, additional bracing, additional steel beams uh, to to you know to withhold um, 
you know, the, hold this, this chandelier, which is absolutely epic. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have some shots we're going to put on the screen. <laughs> unbelievable. That chandelier. Well, How much is a chandelier? But... Over a million dollars. That that single chandelier is, is over a million dollars. Like I said, it's 55,000 individual Swarovski crystals. And uh, and I'll tell you, it was um, just the the manpower to be able to install it. I, I was I was dangling off a of scaffolding at, at you know eleven or twelve at night and and uh, wow. trying to install it. We we had once again a great group of guys uh, working with us to get to get this installed. Um, but it was it was quite arduous. And then uh, in the basement, and I'm sure you'll show some photos. Uh, that chandelier. It's a it's a series of hand blown Murano glass balls uh, off of basically you know piano wire, and and then a series of lights that that light them up. So we ended up printing a one to one scale of this whole chandelier on the floor and used a laser pointer, or a laser light, and we move it to the next dot, and we go up in a boom lift and we screw in one line and then we come back down and we move the laser light to the next one. So we were working on that for better part of a month and a half wow to be able to install that one and just you know one after another um some of these chandeliers you know i mean it was weeks every crystal had to be individually mounted and they're you know tens of thousands of of crystals each so that was <laughs> yeah you mentioned you had some pictures of it so make sure to send it to me like I, I, uh, yeah. well you laid everything out using laser yeah well wow. no, it was it was it was interesting i, I remember when we were originally printing you know the, the the papers to to lay down on the floor downstairs in the basement. The guys, like, what 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 are you doing? <laughs> but it was yeah. I mean, you know, imagine a, a 40, 50 foot wide by a hundred plus foot, um, you know, exact replica of what's going up on the ceiling. We've got it on the floor, and we're we're sitting there laser lighting. Well, that's the thing. Stuff like that you just cannot find anywhere else. It's like one off. It's a piece of art, and not only does it take a lot of effort, but also ingenuity like how do you even come up with assembling that stuff like you're saying and i think the buyer of this house how many people are qualified to buy this house by the way so at at the price point i mean we're we're at 139 million dollars on on this home 36,000 square feet and and you know when you look just straight at, at the numbers you know square footage to to price we're, we're on par with with bel air in general but um I, I would be very, very hard pressed to find another home in the area with this quality, this level of finish, uh, this amount of detail. You won't find a single square inch of drywall anywhere in the house. Everything has some kind of a covering, whether it's it's a stone, whether it's wood, whether it's uh, you know Italian wallpaper and old Jeffries. E everything has some kind of a texture, some kind of a material, a cladding. Uh, e everything was really done to to you know perfection it's a perfection and so you know it's 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 not something you're you're gonna find um now i started rambling i forgot the original question the question oh, is how many people are qualified to buy this like so you gotta be a billionaire i oh, would imagine yeah like um, the starting point so i i'd say somewhere in the range of probably 2500 to 3000 in the world wow you you know this is uh this is definitely a trophy property this is a, a show property this is um, someone who, you know, is worth the six, eight, ten billion dollars. Is most likely going to be in in Los Angeles a couple weeks out of the year, month and a half out of the year. Wants to come in and and you know be able to to indulge, have events, uh, you know, maybe maybe a large party or something of that nature. But this is truly a, an absolute trophy property, and and yeah, there's probably twenty five hundred or, or three thousand people in the world who financially. Financially, <laughs> I'm going to narrow it down. I think you have to be an art connoisseur to really, truly appreciate it. Uh, whoever is going to buy this house is going to be a very interesting person. Like you have to be, you have to be truly appreciative of all the work that went into it. It's uh, I, I, I'm, I love attention to detail. I love this kind of stuff. If I had the billion, I would probably already give you an <laughs> offer. But um, I, I think that's kind of like this the distinguishing part about a buyer like there are many expensive properties out there yeah. but there are not many that have this much attention to detail and a finesse in literally every aspect of it you know in, interestingly enough the uh the showings that we've had with other builders other developers um you know people that maybe aren't in in this type of a space but 
but no or some way, shape, or form associated with construction are some of the the uh, most enthusiastic about the property because they truly understand the time, energy, and effort to to bring a property to this level. Right. Um, you know, you, like I said, you. I, I never like to <laughs> to badmouth other developers, but you have several developers who you know, hey, I'm trying to build a twenty thousand or thirty thousand square foot home, and they're more concentrated on, you know, they're more they're focusing more on on the square footage, right, rather than the intended use case. What is this room for? What is the space for? And and the finishes, and every space in this house has some kind of a reason. You know, it's not like hey, we made a two thousand square foot room that's white walls just to say I've got another two thousand square feet. Every square inch of this home at 36,000 square feet has a reason, you know, whether it's the cigar lounge, whether it's the walk-in vodka box, whether it's the nightclub, the gym, the theater, the concession stand going into the theater, the security rooms, everything has a reason, has a place. And, and so that's something that you, you don't really see. And so because of that, you know, um, what I found is, you know, people in, in fashion, people that have that aesthetic eye. Uh, that have come and viewed the home, absolutely adore it and appreciate it. Other people that are builders or own property come from real estate and development and understand the the effort that that goes into it can can truly appreciate it. Um, interestingly enough, pe- people that are big uh, watch connoisseurs or car connoisseurs and and have that desire and aesthetic for you know truly that that finer element of of life um, ha- have loved the property. Right. So you know it. it you're right. It, it takes a unique person. And, you know, I, I don't say, okay, who's the next owner? I, I look at this like a piece of art, like a, you know, a, a trophy, a trophy property. So it's who's the next caregiver? You know, it's people who collect art. You really have to find the right person for you, the house. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think you guys are in good hands. So you have <laughs> one of the best agents we do. I've ever met, Sean Elliott. I want to give him a plug. Yeah. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's definitely the the right guy to sell this home. And I'm sure he's going to find you the buyer. You know, and and I'll say he he is uh, just a, a great person. Um, I, I've I've really enjoyed working with Sean, and uh, has a, a great energy to him. Um, and for how successful he is, how humble he is, just like you too. You're super <laughs> humble. I love chatting with you. No, like I said, I you know I've just been blessed in life. I, I don't really know how or why, and uh, you know for some reason I, I've been given some amazing opportunities. I've, I've had some amazing mentors, amazing friends. Uh, I, I I don't know why and. And so I appreciate every moment, and and I, I definitely feel like Sean Sean's the same way. Yeah, he, he treats uh, the 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 billionaire with the same amount of respect, and uh, you know that he does the the, the, the gardener. I mean, yeah. you know, I've I've had my crews here and and sweeping up right before showing, and Sean's here before, and you know, is telling the guys thank you. So it's it's that that appreciation, and I'm I'm the same way. I um there's there's definitely two types of leaders in in the world, and especially on a job site. You've got the guys who, who sit back and, you know, I call them the, the armchair leader um, who goes, hey, you go do that, you go do that, you go do that. And then, uh, you know, you have the the battlefield leaders who are like, hey, I'm, I'm charging in the Alexander the Great. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the tip of the uh, the sword and everyone follow in. And that's always the type of leader I've, I've been. If I'm asking my guys to, you know, carry 50 pound bags of concrete up to the roof. You've got to be on the front line. They, they've got one on their shoulder. I've got two on mine. And, and that's really what it takes to to you know drive the the team on a project like this um through those late nights through those early mornings through the hey guys we got to get this done if they've seen you consistently be there in the trenches with them uh they're they're going to give you that 110 percent. so you touched upon something that's very near and dear to my heart like i don't want to pivot too much away from the house yep. just a short break and we'll get <laughs> right back to it <laughs> but from the very beginning, you mentioned that you have to be in the right place at the right time. You know, it's how often I hear this from the most successful people in the world. First of all, it takes humility to realize that because not many, sometimes people say, oh, my success is just only. And sometimes that's like short-sighted and that success fades away from them in, the, in an instant. And secondly, it is very true that you it, it, you have to be out there in the world you have to expose yourself to the elements in order for that moment to come about. Another thing is, uh, I don't know if, if you're a man of faith. I think you are. I am. So am I. And I, I think having that understanding that sometimes life is not in our complete control and we have to just go about it with our best attitude, with our best effort, 
and sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. And when it happens, you rejoice and you stay humble and you say, thank you, God. Yeah. And when it doesn't, you rejoice and you stay humble. Thank you, God. It's yeah. not the time. Uh, and it's just very nice and validating to hear it from somebody like yourself because you truly are in a very unique situation, very unique, a uh, unique place where you are building one of the best homes. A lot of people would love to be in your position and they're probably aspiring. And I hope uh, yeah. they hear the message that you have to be humble and, uh, yeah. say, no, I want you no, to no, I, verbalize. I, I, think, uh, <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I've, I've said it now multiple times. Uh, it, it, it was a blessing. Um, I, I was open to an opportunity and, and God said, Hey, here's, here's something. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's keeping your eyes open to an opportunity, um, being open to receiving that blessing and, and then following through. And a lot of people are, are going through their lives and saying, Hey, this is, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm looking for. Right. And only looking, they've got their, their blinders on and are only looking for that one specific opportunity, something can come completely out of left field. I hadn't thought of this, but you know what? Maybe, maybe you're, you're connecting with the person or in my case, you know, I saw an opportunity with a good mentor. Um, and I said, you know, I, I, I don't know if necessarily this field is for me, but I believe so much in, in wanting to learn from this person to wanting to, to grow and, and, and the opportunity that I can be given, not just financially, but, but in terms of being able to better myself by, by working with this person and under this person, um, that it, it made sense in, in a heartbeat. And I, I, you know, like I said, it's been, I work 80, 90 hours a week, but, um, I, I wouldn't change it. It's, it's work. well, when it's, when you're enjoying it, it's not yeah. work. It's like you're living yeah. 80 to 90 hours a week <laughs> and being around the right people. It's, it truly is everything. You it have is. to be surrounded by the right people. I say it over and over again, like whether I have the right employees, the right customers, uh, even family members, you want to surround yourself True. around people that are positive and that can help you grow as an individual. Uh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. It's And it's, I always say, you know, it's it's 10% opportunity and 90% perspiration. It's, it's, hey, when you're given an opportunity, it's rare, grab a hold of it and outwork anyone else that may want to take that opportunity from you. Um, you know, I, when, when I first started this, I, I, I didn't know a lot about development. I didn't know a lot about construction. So I had to work twice as hard as anyone else going in. And that and makes it even more impressive. <laughs> I just, I want for people to let that sink in for a second. You come from a totally different background, Entirely high different. tech, right? Yep. And you got into developing some of the greatest spec homes in the world. Uh, yeah. So it took a lot more I, effort. <laughs> You know, and, and and I'm sure Joe saw that saw that in you. It's like he didn't just pick you randomly. Like, eh, that I'll, I'll let him try it. You know, I'll let him try it. <laughs> you, you you don't let people try on on something of this size. Um, and 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 that's a that's a great example of of some someone seeing something in you that you don't even see in yourself, and and saying, hey, you don't see it yet, but I, there's something special here. And, uh, and then, you know, if someone sees that in you, if someone gives you that opportunity, you have to work 110, 120% harder to make sure you don't let them down. Right. And, and so, you know, if, if there's an issue at 11 o'clock at, at night on a project, I'm jumping in my car, I'm, I'm heading down there. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we had an issue on, on a job site. This was New Year's two years ago. And, you know, I literally spent New Year's Eve on a hillside in a torrential downpour, um, counting down <laughs> to, to midnight, um, you know, because that's, that's the, the appreciation I have for the opportunity Joe gave me. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I could be, you know, w one of a thousand people he, he could have chosen to have, have given an opportunity. I think he chosen well. And <laughs> Joe, you did a good job. <laughs> um, but no, and, and, and I, I, you know, I, I try to give back as much as I can as well. I, I really try to go out and mentor others. Um, because knowledge, it's one of those things you can give it away a thousand times over and still ret retain it. It's, it's one of the greatest gifts you can give someone, right. um, you know, giving someone a pat on the back, letting someone know they're doing a, a good job, but also, Hey, if they do mess up or there is an issue, finding some way to go, okay, let's motivate you and let's, let's take you to that next level. And here's what we can do. Um, like I said, I've been blessed with amazing mentors throughout my life. And, and so if you, if you hoard that, if you hoard that, 
that attention, that knowledge, you know, Hashem, God's not going to give that to you. So as much as you get it, you have to give it. Um, you know, if, if you're out there and, and you're receiving these blessings, if you're if you're receiving aid from others, if you're receiving opportunities from others, as much as in, is in your power, pass it you, you've got to pass it forward. Yeah, and absolutely. and that's the only way to uh, you know continue to receive them. And I, I truly believe that. I once heard a very wise saying that um, people sometimes focus too much on receiving. And what happens if you have a vessel? that is just closed on all sides and it just receives, it receives, it receives. It's just going to shatter at some point. You have to have an, like the other side that actually passes through. And the more you give, the bigger the vessel becomes. It just keeps Absolutely. growing and growing. All right, we're going to continue where we left off. Some technical yeah. difficulties as always, but nothing to deter us. Um, so we just spoke about uh, the importance of seeing the bigger picture in life yeah. and paying it forward and uh, becoming a vessel that gives rather than just receives. Uh, because the, the people that give, they receive more just by definition. Because uh, if we're following in God's footsteps, God created the whole world to give. And right. if we want to imitate, we have to give as well. And then we become a conduit for blessings. Now let's get back to the house again. <laughs> What, and, and just one last thought on that. Yes, what, what I'll say is when you come from a, a, a place of being open to, to all the goodness the world actually has, and, uh, and you don't immediately cast type people, oh, you're this, you're that. And, uh, you know, like we were talking about Sean earlier, he treats a billionaire the same way as he'll, he'll treat a gardener cleaning up. Um, when, when you have that kind of an outlook and you try to find the good in everybody, you can really get the best out of everybody. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick story, and then we'll <laughs> move back to the house. So we have a multifamily project we're we're about to start up in uh, in East Hollywood, and I was over there the other day, and there was a homeless encampment, and there's you know eight ten homeless living on the property. There's been some concerns with with the city, um, and you know I'll come in, I'll do a big cleanup, etc. <laughs> and uh, and so I showed up, you know, the night before we were going to do a big cleanup. I brought burritos for everybody and food for everybody, drinks and. And so, listen, guys, this is what's going on. What's, you know, whatever is important for you, please, you know, make sure you take off. We're going to be doing a big cleanup tomorrow. Anything that's still on the site, we're going to be throwing away. And, uh, you know, so, some of the people on the site said, yes, we realize it's gotten dirty. Um, actually, the, the following day, I, I had garbage bags and et cetera. They, they were right there alongside my crew helping to clean up. Wow. And we're really appreciative. I bought everyone breakfast. I brought everyone lunch. I brought everyone dinner. I, you know, I, I gave them, you know, some money as well for, for helping just just like I was paying my guys to do uh, the, the cleanup, and they were genuinely appreciative. And and so I think a lot of the time, uh, if, if we can treat others with with the same respect that we treat a billionaire, you know, in, in this case, homeless uh, or, or unhoused, you know, um, when when we're able to show them the same respect, a lot of the time, that's that's what they're, they're yearning for. Just like I... You know, I, I'm looking for, for respect uh, in, in, in my life and in my line of work. Um, I, I don't demand it. I try to earn it. And and if you give people the opportunity to earn respect, uh, you'll, you'll be amazed how often they will not only meet your expectations, but far exceed them. So that's uh, one, of, one of my other little anecdotes. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I like, uh, first of all, I agree. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Uh, giving people opportunity to to do something positive is extremely important. Uh, there is a famous uh, saying: you can give a man a fish, but what's the saying? Or you can teach him how to fish. Right. You Which one's him, better? Yeah, no, you can give a man a fish, and he can eat for a day, or yeah. you can teach a man to fish, and, and he'll eat for a lifetime. Life. Exactly. And and you're absolutely right. And I I think a lot of the time. If, if you can teach someone a skill as opposed to doing it for them, you know, so often you'll, you'll, you know, you'll see a guy and he's working on an element and you know, you're not going to repeat it again in the same project and you can do it yourself in 30 minutes, but it's going to take you an hour to teach him how to do it right. And you can go, okay, let me just do it. And, and I'm not going to spend an hour. I save myself 30 minutes. Give them that time. Give them that knowledge. Give them that extra 30 minutes of your time to show them how to do it, to teach them. Because they'll be able to take that on and, and move forward for, for a lifetime. Um, it's, yeah, it's it's giving a gift. Yeah. And, 
Okay, now let's Sorry, back, back, <laughs> back to the house. Just there's so much to cover about this yeah, house. No, I, I feel like I want to have you back on the on the podcast. I'm, I'm around. I love talking to you, <laughs> first of all. And uh, yeah, back on the house. Yep. There's so many details in this house. And I know it's it's beyond one podcast to cover. Tell me just your favorite, uh, from somebody that's seen this house build, like seeing a baby grow, what is your favorite part? Like you walk in, oh, the, the, I want to be there. So there, there are a couple of elements in this home that I think are, are truly spectacular. That uh, And I, I after every showing, I, I always ask people, hey, what was your, your favorite element? And it comes down to a couple of them. Uh, right, right behind us back here, we've got an 18 foot by 22 foot TV. We're gonna show it. <laughs> we, we, we can lift it up. Um, <laughs> no, I, I have, I have plenty of video of it. <laughs> uh, we've got an 18 foot by 22 foot TV that lifts up out of this pool right behind us, and it was um, just just fun to work on. It's 2200 nit. It looks amazing during the day. It looks spectacular at night. Uh, 3.2 pixel pitch, but I, I ended up, you know designing uh, uh, panel placement and speaker placement and working in, and designing the, uh, the hydraulic lift system, doing the install. Um, That's not something you buy off the shelf. That's no. all one no. of a kind of work. But, and it helped probably with your background in technology. The, the, the tech definitely helped. Um, and we, we had some, uh, some great partners on it as well. Um, shout out to, to Plug It In and uh, Car Carousel, um, Planar. So uh, uh, amazing uh, amazing team effort there, um, but it was it was just fun, and it's one of the elements. Every time people come in, they uh, they just ooh and awe at it. Um, everybody likes a big TV, and this one is absolutely spectacular. You will be very 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 hard pressed to to find anything in the city or or, or possibly even the world that that can rival it. And uh, and knowing that I was so intimately involved from the initial concept to you know the designing to okay we got a nano cutter we got to make it waterproof we've got it you know what's what's going on with the weight and then the details we have uh, a wind uh, speedometer on the top so you know if wind is over 25 knots it'll automatically drop it so i don't have a three million dollar sail flying down the hillside same um, thing with rain right that has right. a rain sensor well and, and it is waterproof um, so it, it does have a rain sensor but but also i mean every every component is waterproof wow so um you know being being next to a pool, you, you got to plan for that. So that's one of the elements that was just, it was fun to work on. We, uh, we have once again, one of the, the crowd favorites, uh, we, we have a walk-in vodka bar, yeah. um, downstairs. It, Who it, came up with that idea? <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> so who woke up one day and said, we got to make a vodka that, bar. That, that was Joe. Um, a, a majority of the design elements, the, the true concepts, the, the brilliance, the, Hey, I, I have this idea, uh, came from Joe and, and yeah, let me tell you something, yeah. just a quick anecdote here. <laughs> um, you know, we took a lot of, uh, we filmed a lot of details of this house and we yeah. post reels, shorts once in a while, mix it up with other content. The moment that vodka bar hits the Instagram or YouTube immediately gets thousands and thousands of views it's it's amazing it's different it's different who who has you know a walk-in ice bar inside their house and uh you know it was, it was one of those things it was um you know h- how do we make this how do we make it look it's so also cool? artful it oh, looks the way it looks it's amazing yeah it was all hand carved um it took months and months and months once again you know, on the install alone, I mean, I was here till midnight or one every night for probably a week and a half, week, week and a half. Um, it was, uh, it was a labor of love and, and we had an idea, we had a concept and bringing it from, you know, on paper, Hey, this is what we want it to look like to trying eight, 10, 12 different materials. Is it port glass? Is it an acrylic? Is it some kind of a rubber? Do we actually do it with ice and just hope and pray that it's always at the right temperature. Um, you know, what do we do to give that look and, and almost that like Vegas nightclub right. kind of, you know, party atmosphere and, and feel. And it was, once again, it's, it's, it's an ooh and an awe. And in a, in a home of this size, oh, pardon me, 36,000 square feet in a home of this size for an eight by 10 room, 80 square feet, out of that 36,000 square feet, 
um, to have such an impact uh, just tells you the, the level of time, energy, and effort uh, that, that went into it. So that's, that's another one for me that um, really stands out. Uh, and then lastly, I, I probably have to say the car elevator in the nightclub. Oh, that's amazing. The car elevator is something else. Um, yeah. So we, uh, for, for, for the viewers, I'm, I'm sure I'll show a quick yeah. video, but uh, you, you pull into your single car garage and it lowers into the nightclub. And uh, how many cars you can fit on there? You you can fit five down below and then then one on top. So it, it really takes a single car garage and turns it into a six car garage. You know what I noticed? <laughs> that um, I think it was your car park when we we're filming. <laughs> it was like the spotlight that you guys put. It just accentuates the beauty, the shape of the car that's parked on the lip. Yeah, it's actually quite clever. I'm sure you had that in mind, but I noticed it. It's really cool. <laughs> It uh, no, it 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 definitely is. Um, it's you know that you, you touched on something wonderful here, which is you you can build a beautiful home, but if you don't light it in the right, right way, if you have the wrong color lighting, you know, if if you're running a four thousand or five thousand Kelvin instead of a twenty seven hundred, it gives a you know it's that sterile white light versus you know something nice and warm it has a very different diff uh, impact. If you have spotlights, like you said, on on uh, it, it it was my car. It's a 1985 Porsche 911 Euro Edition. It was um, my my father's, and he he recently gifted it to me. So nice. thanks, pop. Shout out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, absolutely beautiful car, stunning lines. But it you know those lights on it just really make a big impact. Yeah, it accentuates. And, yeah, the shape of the, the shape, car. the curve, and and whoever you know whoever ends up as a caretaker of this home. I'm sure they're going to have an amazing car collection. Yes. And the fact that you can see, you know, five stunning, amazing cars displayed in your nightclub in the basement, uh, you know, and then be able to recall it. I, I say it's like a car bending machine. It's like a Pez dispenser. You know, there's there's a panel up in the garage. You say, hey, I want the Lamborghini or, or the Conesag or, 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 you know, McLaren or the Bugatti. You know, hey, this is the one I want to drive today. You hit one button. And it, it pulls it out and, and moves it up and and, uh, and yeah, it for you. Beautiful glass guardrail. It's just just chill with your friend, drink a whiskey, admire the cars. And, and really yeah, so how much did it cost to assemble the portion? Um, oh wow! So the the lift itself was right around two and a half, two and a half, three million. And then how long uh, did it take? That was so the the first portion was installed basically at, at foundation and, and framing. So that's that's one of those elements you you have to plan out ahead, yeah. literally years and years and years in advance. So a portion of it was done when you know they were starting the foundation. Other elements were added in during framing. Uh, then when you're getting to your finishes, you're bringing in other elements. Um, you know, upon your final wiring. So from start to finish, that was a four or five year install. And uh, so a lot of these elements, it's not like hey, I can just plan at the end. Oh, I want to put this in. You're, you know, it's it's too little, too late. Uh, so you have to really start planning and have your vision early on. Okay, this is what we're going to do. This is what we want to do. And and start kind of implementing that uh, from from day one. Um, but yeah, no, it, it was, uh, it's it's a beautiful element. It's, it's it, a lot of it's fun. It's amazing. One other thing that I've noticed, yeah. um, I, I, I got a chance to walk through the entire house. I think you even give me some keys to open some doors in the back just to see like things that other people haven't seen. Uh, I noticed, first of all, the layout mm -hmm. of the floor plan is very interesting because it's almost like it has these kind of like micro um, worlds within the house. You have a suite for the master bedroom on its own, one access to it, Not no other bedroom shares access to that uh, suite. Then you have other bedrooms in the back, and they're all kind of secluded. Then you have this guest. It's it's like, at first I was like, why is it hard to access them? But then it dawned on me, you want to give people privacy. So if you have a big party, everyone has complete privacy and their own access to each layout of the house. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think one of the things that can truly make or break a home like this is is the layout. How, how functional is it? And, and more importantly, how functional is it based off of the intended use case? So in, in this, in, you know, in this scenario, it, it is truly an entertainer's home. 
This is somewhere where, you know, you're going to host a, a charity event and have a thousand people in, in your home. And how do you protect your own private spaces? Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. With, with the master being on its own separate level with a single entrance point, you can place a security guard at, at your front door or at the top of the stairs and know that there's no way for someone to enter your, your private master, you know, master bedroom, master suite. Um, it's almost like you have multiple homes inside one home. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, that's that's really the the intention here. So you know you've got your master, you've got your your family, what I call the family wing with with multiple bedrooms. But once again, you could corner you know corner that off um, uh, during a, an event, a showing, a, a party, whatever it might be. The the guest house entirely separate from entrance to the main home. So you have separate entrance to the side gate if you wanted to. There's a separate staircase up to it. It's on its own alarm system. So, you know, if you're the owner of the home and, you know, someone was coming to visit you, you didn't want them having full access to the home. They've got an amazing guest suite. Incredible. Um, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite meals. Yeah, almost as good as the master. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> the views are amazing. Yeah. Uh, but, but you have, you know, they would have access to the pool area, their own private suite, the roof deck, but not into the main residence. So, it, it, you know, a lot of attention went into exactly creating these these different spaces the uh the basement area truly an entertainer's uh space and and you know coming in you you, you it's just immediately impactful and uh and you know the, the the patio areas the spaces the the multiple areas where you can sit down and have a comfortable conversation like this even in the midst of a thousand person party, right. you know, you have multiple nooks, crannies, little seating areas, a fire pit over here, um, you know, seating over here, fire pits in the back. You, you have some really intimate spaces in such a vast home. I actually get to experience that. Yep. Sean had a like a party here uh, for broker preview and it was definitely over a hundred people. Yeah. But at any given point in time, I was actually filming while the party was happening yeah. and I found privacy almost like, okay, I need to find space where I can film. I just go one space, another space. There was over a hundred people in the house and yet there were so many opportunities to find a space where I needed to film. It was, it was really cool. It's yeah, no. And, and that's, um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, a, a shout out and, 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 uh, you know, an amazing attribute of, of both the architect and, and Joe and their, their vision. And it's that kind of planning once again, you know, it's, it's planning, 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 and then execution and, you know, measuring twice and then cutting, uh, it's, it's that kind of, of planning of, Hey, what's the intended final goal? What's the intended final use case? And then how do we design around that, um, to, to, to accomplish that? And I, I, I think, um, you know, overall the, the team did an amazing job really creating that here. What is one thing that. Um, I think a family that moves in here will enjoy the most, in your opinion. Uh, First of all, do, do you see yeah. a family with kids living here or you, or you think it's somebody that's older? You know, it, it could go a couple of directions. Because uh, you do have space for both the kids mm -hmm. and you also have for mature audience as well. Right. No, I, I think it could go, uh, you know, to set a, an international uh, uh, family. It's in town, you know, a couple weeks, a couple months out of the year and wants an L.A. home base and wants to feel comfortable, but also be able to entertain. I, you know, the house lends itself very well for that. Uh, I, I could see it with, you know, uh, being bring, being a primary home for a family. I would say probably not a family with extremely young children. <laughs> you, you, you probably don't want toddlers running around here, but um slightly grown children I, I i could quite easily see uh here as well i i will say you know that the movie theater and the concession stand we have going into it where uh is is just a fun environment uh once again during during covid uh you know all the movie theaters were were shut down and my daughter her name is uh is raya and they they had a movie that came out called um so raya the last dragon or Raya some something of that nature and all the movie theaters were, were closed. So we ended up going down as a family and being able to watch it downstairs. And, you know, my, my daughter came in and, you know, there's a little concession stand and she was able to pick out some candy. And, and so being able to have 
anything that you would need to leave the home for uh, here and at your fingertips, whether it's, it's you know, an IPIC quality, you know, or movie theater or, you know, an amazing home gym or a nightclub in the basement or, you know, all, all these elements that traditionally, hey, I'm, I'm going out to Equinox or, you know, I'm going out to this movie theater or hey, I'm going out to a nightclub. You can bring all of those elements into your home. And so you don't really need to leave. Uh, I think Complete like, self-sufficiency. Yeah, <laughs> it is. If you want to stay away from, like, if you're ultra famous and right. you just want to have basically, com- and, and, and the thing is, there are homes like that. Yeah. But to be in Bel Air, the most iconic, with this level of view, right? That's when it becomes basically one in a billion. Yeah, I, I, you might have homes with amazing gyms. You might have homes, but to put everything together, that's really makes special even down to the things that truly fascinated me again i've seen thousands of homes very expensive one but this is like things where i'm a little bit crazy i like to go into like i've mentioned earlier you gave me keys to explore the back (laughs) of the house right right i noticed that first of all there's an incredible industrial kitchen there to basically like state of the art you bring michelin chef and they'll cook behind the scenes with without ever being visible to the rest of the guests, and and you can entertain, and there's like a network of of uh, passages where they can serve, and 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 not only that, if you have the best chef in the world, <laughs> he walks out and he has all this view, right? Like you don't want him to sit and and be stuck in a terrible environment. You're not right. going to attract the best of the best. Nope, his place is also luxurious. <laughs> And even like the the uh, the quarters for the um, for the staff, right? They're like five star hotel rooms. Yeah. No, I, I I think you're absolutely right. So you know, obviously, we have this amazing ballroom nightclub downstairs. Uh, we have two very large bars right in the center, but we designed them on skids. So you know, if you wanted to put a boxing ring in the center or or make it a dance floor, you can easily with a pallet jack lift those bars up and move them to to the side. We have a 2,000 square foot commercial kitchen and, and you know, truly done right um, that's that's right behind the car lift, that's out of sight, that has a separate access. Um, and there's two refrigerators. So you can yep. probably stop, like, if if world has gone crazy, you can probably <laughs> put enough food there for, oh, for a couple of years. I mean, we have a walk-in fridge, a walk-in freezer, a mountain of storage, a full commercial kitchen. That's that's really you know any any chef would be more than happy to uh, to go in there and cook and more importantly I mean we we hired a kitchen consultant we had him hey what's the layout what's the placement what's the spacing that you like what's your your turn radius that you need here what equipment do you recommend so it wasn't just like hey let's put a stove back there let's put a fryer there it was what what goes where and why and and so you know even something like that that you'll never see. The, the homeowner isn't really going to think about it on the, on the uh, you know, initial visit or two or three or five or ever. Uh, we think about it because that's what's going to help you attract the best staff for a home like this. You, you mentioned the, um, you know, some of the, the house staff quarters. I mean, they're, they're gorgeous. I, I was five-star <laughs> hotel rooms. Yeah. You know, you, you go into the restrooms and it's floor-to-ceiling stone and, and the rooms, just like we appointed the, the bedrooms or italian wallpaper and gorgeous so you, you know i you're... oftentimes see the the staff quarters like the most basic possible like let's just finish it so they can sleep somewhere but it, it makes so much sense you want to treat even your staff really well because you depend on them right. and your your life is in their hands half the time yeah and you want them to actually enjoy where they are yeah and and you know and that's it if, if like i said I, i've said many many times like i i feel like my life is is a blessed life I, I truly feel like I've been given this amazing opportunity and uh, and just somehow got to work on this project. But once again, the next caretaker, the next owner of this home, their staff, you want them to feel like they've been blessed. They've been given this opportunity. They've been, you know, plucked uh, and, and, you know, God's given them a, hey, here, here's, here's a blessing. And this is the environment you get to work in. And, uh, and when they see it like that, there's, there's 120 percent, just like I give 120 yes. percent. They will as well, and that that end, uh, you know, wh- whomever the caretaker becomes, uh, you know, they're going to get the the benefit 
of us in the forethought of going, hey, you want these people to be happy. Just like you said, they've got access to your bedroom. Right. They're the ones cooking your food. They're the ones helping keep the place clean. They're, you know, when you're not here, they're they're the ones treating their home, the, your, your home like their home. And so, you know, if, if they truly see it as a blessed opportunity, they're going to make the most of it. They're, they're going to be right there by your side. Um, and so that's, that's why we went the extra mile on, on their rooms, just like everyone else's. I'm going to say something completely out of the left field. <laughs> okay. Forgive me. No, no, please. Okay. So we, we do live in the world of, uh, there's, there's a lot of homelessness in, especially in Los Angeles. Yep. Um, I, I want to know, is there any chance, or maybe you guys are already thinking about this? to donate some of the proceeds of the sale to help the homeless people. And maybe like even the buyer can be encouraged. I think that's just a, such a fabulous cause because when, when you do build the best homes for a single family, maybe some of that love can be spread for for those in need. Um, I mean, you, you, you bring that up. There There is a 5% of, of all sales now in Los Angeles um, over a certain dollar price, which this definitely uh, qualifies as goes towards homeless housing. So, you know, whomever buys this this home, whether or not they intended to, right. 5% of the purchase price is going towards homeless housing and and homeless programs here in that's Los That's amazing. So, so if it sells for $140 million, that's uh, what, $7 million? $7 million, going? correct. Towards homeless people. That's right. amazing. So, you know, I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, when people talk about, oh, the opulence and this stuff, Yes, but there there is a direct benefit as well. Um, that's a huge amount. <laughs> it's it's not a paltry sum, by any right. means. Yeah, that that's truly amazing. I think whoever buys this house should have that appreciation. It's going to bring them a lot of blessing in their life, uh, knowing that. And let's actually, um, just in the interest of time, I think we can talk about this forever <laughs> and ever and ever. Yeah, uh, but it's first of all getting dark, and it we is. are outside, and it's getting colder. Um, you mentioned that you guys are doing other types of development, multifamily Correct. homes and stuff like that. Tell me a little bit more about those type of projects. It's very different from building for one intended audience versus a multitude. How big are those projects? Um, I mean, we've, we've got uh, several multifamilies going up right now, anywhere from you know 30 units up to 200 units. So it's, uh, it's kind of all over the board. Um, it's a very, very different type of build. And, and I'll say, you know, we put a lot of the same energy, time, and thought into the, the multifamily like we do on, on the ultra high end. So it's, it's what, what's that end use? What's that user, uh, that, that future tenant um, going to experience when, when they move in? And, and like we said multiple times, you know, you treat the person up here the same way you treat the person down here in terms of socioeconomic. I'm not saying, you know, necessarily someone's above another, but... But regardless of, of socioeconomic stature, your home, where you come into, has such an impact on who you are, how your day is. It's your sacred place. It's your sacred place, exactly. And, you know, it, it can really make your life that much better or that much worse. And so, you know, like I said, we, we have multiple uh, uh, multifamilies going up right now. How big are some of the biggest projects? Yeah. Uh, so right now we have a 200-unit Wow. Uh, going up in as uh, student housing, grad student housing up in uh, Central California, um, on top of about seventy thousand square feet of commercial, and and once again, you you think about. I remember when I was a student, and uh, my my first uh, non dorm apartment was eight feet by twelve feet. I, I felt like a king. I you know it was in a in a kind of old and rundown hotel in in Boston. And, uh, you know, I had a bunk bed. I threw away the bottom one. I had a couch under it. I bought the biggest TV I could find. But to me, you know, I, I was an absolute king in that place. And and I, I think back to that student experience and what it meant to have my own place, have my own space. Um, so, you know, we, we've tried to deliver on, on, you know, looking back, hey, if I truly could go all out but still keep it within a, a reasonable budget, what would that look like? And so... You know, we're we're in the process of uh, building this. We're, we're looking at June, July, as uh, as our open date, and so this will be grad student housing up in in UC Merced, so Central California. Uh, like I said, a ton of commercial, and then uh, personally, we're you know I'm opening a uh, a British pub underneath. So 
<laughs> that's awesome. It's yeah, yeah, that'll be fun. Um, you know, a little bit of the hospitality side as well. Uh, but it's you know, once again, it it doesn't necessarily matter the type of project. It's as long as you keep your focus on what the end user, right? What what that that person that's going to be inhabiting that space is going to experience. If it's 400 square feet, make the best 400 square feet possible and make sure you plan out, hey, a USB port here would really be awesome. And, you know, this type of, hey, if I had a, a pull-out um, a countertop under this portion of the kitchen, that would be really functional. And, and, and you can do a lot with even, you know, relatively small spaces to have a great impact to really improve the the you know, kind of the standard, the, the living that, that you're uh, enjoying there. So, yeah, you know, uh, uh, as you were saying all yeah. these things, you know, a thought came to my mind because it is somewhat of a controversial topic. Sometimes, you know, people are going all out building huge homes and yet there is a homelessness problem. Right. But now that, first of all, you've mentioned something that I think a lot of people don't know. 5% will help uh, fund housing. Correct. Not only that, you guys are building just like you're building a one-off work of art house. This, the proceeds of this, help you build multi-family uh, housing as well. Absolutely. And if you wouldn't profit from this, you wouldn't be capable. Wouldn't be able to. Not only that, the innovation that sometimes comes through these mega projects trickles down to the other projects that are making them better. I'm sure you're carrying over experience, the know-how. Uh, the the things that made you make this. It's just like, you know, some people argue, let's not have the military. Let's not have NASA. Why are we spending so much, th- so much time and money and resources? I don't care if people walk on the moon or on Mars. What they don't realize is the technology that comes to be created from those efforts, even though maybe today it's being used by an astronaut on the moon, but in a year or 10 years is being used by everybody pulling out their cell phones, that same technology. Now it's in the palm of your hand. So building something as magnificent as this, yes, it might benefit one family that will truly uh, enjoy life, but they, first of all, they got there through benefiting society. I'm a big believer in in free market. I think people should be encouraged to work as hard as you possibly can Yes, you should give to society, but right. you should never be limited to the heights that you can reach in life. Absolutely. I came from Soviet Union. I know what socialism is. Right. Absolutely doesn't work. The moment you take out incentives from somebody achieving their absolute best and reaching these magnificent, again, it's a work of art, then the innovation stops, the effort stops, mm-hmm. then everybody suffers. So I think this... This house is a testament to that, that not only is it is is work of art, but it truly does help. It will trickle down, like building a TV from <laughs> something that didn't exist before right. on this on, on this magnitude. Things like this, those skills will, will eventually go and benefit the masses. And uh, I, I'm I'm grateful to see this. I'm grateful to be part of it and, and experience. This part of my job that that uh, I really love. First of all, meeting people like you, uh, meeting people like Joe, like Shot, and everybody involved in in making the best of the best in the world. Um, there's a lot of mediocre stuff out there, yeah. but when you truly ha- try your absolute best to do the best work while staying humble, while trying to help others in need and and improving society at large, that's that's what the world needs more of. And I hope that other builders get inspired by this. Other people that watch anything you do in life, any work you do, always try to dedicate to better society. And uh, we shouldn't say, oh, that guy has it. Let's take away what he has and give it. No, let's empower everybody to do their absolute best and inspire them to give to others. So, yeah. Raj, it was an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you. I want to continue and go yeah. on, but we're almost out of life now. I don't even know how the picture is going to turn out, but I know the content is going to be amazing. Well, and, and and thank you so much for for having me on. I've never uh, podcasted before. I've never, you know, uh, done done a show like this. I've I've been told I have a face for radio. So um, you, you have the voice, the face, <laughs> you have everything. You're a star, man. 
the, um, but no, 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 I, I, I truly enjoyed uh, coming in and chatting. Uh, there's, you know, a myriad of topics I'd, I'd love to get into with you in, in the future. Um, in particular, you know, we were start, we were starting to touch on uh, on homeless housing, and and uh, I have very strong views and beliefs on on what the city's doing with that right now. Um, many ways that it could be improved. You know what? Let before we yeah. end. Okay. One last thing. Okay. <laughs> How do you think that can be solved? Because it's getting kind of crazy. It, it's it, out of it control. is. Um, Especially what's happening like in San Francisco. I mean, it's trickling down to here. But I think some of the policies that their government is taking on are disastrous. You know, and and being a developer, um, seeing it from that side, seeing what in another state would take three to six months to get approved, taking a year and a half, two, two and a half years to get approved, um, seeing the sequel lawsuits that are coming out that really have very little to do with the environment and absolutely everything to do with monetary shakedowns, um, seeing the extra expenses that as a developer that you incur to build here in, in Los Angeles and in California, and then realizing that those need to be passed on at the end to make sure that your numbers are still working and it, it's viable. That's the first and foremost, the biggest impact uh, on housing right now. The the fees, the 60, I mean, depending on where you're building, 60 to $80,000 per unit in fees and permit fees and CFD fees and Oh, no, hold on. There's some billionaire passing by. <laughs> As we got into a very interesting topic <laughs> about homelessness, all right. I guess it's just not meant to be for us to finish this conversation today because there is equipment malfunction. As always, technology yeah. sometimes fails us. We, we make plans and God laughs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the I think the silver lining is we decided to have a whole episode dedicated to that. So please stay tuned, subscribe, yeah. follow comment um if ask us the things that we want to cover first of all raj has a lot of insight on that whole topic about homelessness about building and maybe ways out of it how to help society i have my own opinions so please do comment let us know how we should cover that topic in more detail if you have any questions um we'd love to cover that and i just like to say it was an absolute pleasure to talk to you even with the <laughs> equipment malfunctioning, it is what it is. But I think the the best thing is, first of all, the content is unbelievable. Even if sometimes one of the cameras dies and doesn't want to... It just did again. It just did again. That's okay. Uh, we have two other cameras See, and we have the sound. Change. And we have the sound. <laughs> it's, you know, like we said earlier, measure twice, cut once. It's, it's yes. uh, you know, if we had a single camera, this would be an issue. But I, I commend you on the, uh, the professionalism of the of the setup usually i have extra person behind the scenes today is a sunday i couldn't get anybody to come so it is what it is what can i say <laughs> we're trying you know we're we're improving on, on the on the go now this one went out oh wow center one went out as well okay so i guess it's time to conclude <laughs> thank you for watching <laughs> thank you guys <laughs> we'll see you on the next one bye <laughs>